Now that we've looked at the cytology, histology, and physiology of muscle, we're going to look at the bigger picture and look at how muscles work together to bring about movements of the body. So we're going to look at the muscular system as a whole. Now in lectures, we focus on theory. We focus on how things work in the big picture. In lab, of course, you're going to be more focused on individual muscles, where they connect and the motions they bring about. So this is going to be a fairly short topic that will give you an overview of things that you'll look at in more detail in the lab. Broadly speaking, we have two types of muscle contraction, isotonic contractions and isometric contractions. Let's start by looking at the isotonic contractions. Iso means the same. Tonic refers to the tone or tension within a muscle. Let's say that you take a rope and you tie it to a tree and you pull on that rope as hard as you can. The force that you generate is going to be translated into tension within the rope. So when we talk about generating tension, we're talking about generating force. So in an isotonic contraction, the amount of force or tension generated by the muscle stays the same, despite the fact that the muscle may change its size. It may become shorter or longer. We have two types of isotonic contractions based on how the shape of the muscle changes. So let's look at the left side of this diagram first. This is a concentric contraction. We've got a weight and we're lifting it using the biceps of the arm. And the biceps are going to shorten. But this is a contraction where we're not accelerating the weight. We're raising the weight at a constant rate, at a constant speed. And as we do that, the muscle is shortening and the force that's being applied by the muscle is constant. It stays the same. Now imagine you do the opposite. You have the weight lifted and you're going to very slowly just elongate your arm. You're going to extend the elbow joint, but you're going to do that in a controlled manner. So you're going to drop the weight at a controlled speed. You're not just going to let it fall. If you're doing that at a constant rate, at a constant speed, then although the muscle is lengthening, the amount of force it's generating is not changing. In a concentric isotonic contraction, a few things are happening. First of all, we have movement. Secondly, a muscle is shortening to bring about that movement. And thirdly, we have a decrease in the angle of a joint. So if we look at this fellow here and we look at his elbow, that's the angle we're talking about. And the angle is decreasing as he lifts this textbook. So he's bringing this up. He's fighting resistance that's being offered by gravity, pulling down on that textbook. And the muscles of his biceps are shortening. In an eccentric isotonic contraction, we have movement occurring again. We have constant force or tension being generated by the biceps in this example, but the muscle is elongating and the angle of the joint is increasing. So once again, looking at his joint here, we have that and we have the angle getting larger as he drops this textbook. He's faced with the same resistance that he was faced with when he was lifting it. So the force of gravity pulling down on the book is the same. But in this case, what he's doing is he's resisting the drop of that book. I mean, if he just didn't have any tension in his muscles at all, of course, the book would drop right to his sides, but he's resisting that movement. But as he's doing this in a slow controlled fashion, the tension within the muscle, the force generated by the muscle remains the same. In an isometric contraction, there is no movement. So once again, iso means the same. A metric is a measurement of something, in this case, a measurement of length. So the length of the muscle does not change because nothing is moving. And as you can see in this example here, we've got the same fellow holding out a heavy textbook, but this time he's trying to maintain it in the same spot. 
And as you know, a heavy textbook can certainly make your wallet lighter, but if you were to hold it out at arm's length like this, you couldn't do it for very long because you still need to generate tension or force within the muscles to resist the force of gravity. This is a way that you can exercise, actually. If you're really hard pressed and you don't have weights and you wanna build up your muscles and bulk them up a bit, you can do things where you just push against the wall, for instance, as hard as you can. And that is a form of exercise. And I just wanna stress how important isometric contractions can be. If you're doing something very simple, just standing upright, not even moving around, there are many muscles that are contracting isometrically to maintain the rigidity of your body and the rigidity of your spine so you don't simply collapse onto the floor. So isometric contractions, very important when it comes to posture. All right, let's take a look at some general terms that apply to all muscles. We have in this diagram the shoulder joint at the top so that would be the articulation between the scapula and the humerus and then down the bottom the elbow joint there so we see the articulation between the humerus and the ulna and radius on the anterior of the upper arm we have the belly of the biceps the belly of a muscle is kind of the meatiest portion of the muscle it contains muscle cells which of course contain sarcomeres which are going to bring about contraction that contraction is gonna generate tension and the tension is gonna be transferred through tendons to the bone. So tendons connect muscle cells to bone. For most muscles, we're gonna have an origin, which is the part that doesn't move. And we're gonna have an insertion, which is the part that is going to move. So looking at the biceps, we can see that we have two origins and the bi in bicep means two. So we have two origins, both of them on the scapula. The scapula is not going to move when you're flexing your arm. So when you're flexing your arm, there's other muscles connected to the shoulder joint that will maintain it and stop it from moving around. But what is going to move is the insertion. So the insertion down the bottom here is going to move. When the muscle shortens, the arm, of course, is going to be pulled upwards. So the insertion is going to move upwards. It's going to move superiorly. If we look on the back of the arm, we have the triceps there. And the triceps have three heads, as the name suggests. There's three origins. You can see that they originate from the scapula and the humerus. And then we have the insertion onto the olecranon of the elbow. That's the bit of the ulna that sticks out and makes up the elbow. So same thing here. We have the belly creating contraction. That force is going to be transferred to the tendons, but the origin is not going to move. The ulna is going to move and the arm is going to extend. It's going to straighten out. Muscles act on levers or levers if you prefer. A lever consists of a rigid rod that is connected to a fulcrum, which is a point where rotation can occur. So what you're seeing here, we've got a structure called a pivot, and it's just a structure that will present a fulcrum, a rotational point. And then we have this bar that's sitting on top of that. We have a load on one side, and that's going to generate a force that pushes down because of gravity in this case. And then we have an effort being made on the other side of the bar. So we're applying a force somehow to the other side with the intent of raising that load. This is a simple lever. Let's take a look at a simple and rather silly example here. We've got two bunnies on either side of a rod. They're the same weight or mass. And in the middle, we have our pivot exactly in the middle. At the top of that pivot structure, we have our fulcrum and that's where rotation could potentially occur. It's not occurring because there's the same force being exerted on both sides. And both of these masses, both of these bugses are the same distance from that fulcrum. 
Now imagine if we move the fulcrum by moving our pivot. What's going to happen, of course, is that we're going to have an unbalanced situation. One rabbit's going to go up, one rabbit's going to go down. Now why does that happen? The force has remained the same. It's only due to the distance changing between that fulcrum and the object that's exerting the force. Now there's one way that we could balance this out without actually moving that pivot and fulcrum back to the middle. What we could do is we could change the force being generated on either side of the fulcrum. So we've got bugs over here and he has mass of course and because of that he has weight and weight is the force generated by gravity based on his mass. He's generating this force and we could introduce a second character that's a bit more massive, has more weight, generates more force to balance that out. And if you have, let's say, a younger sister or brother or a niece or nephew and you want to ride on the teeter-totter with them and you don't want them to spend all their time up in the air, you might have figured out that if you move closer to the fulcrum, you can actually balance things out and still have a pleasant experience. And I can't believe I've brought the big chungus meme into my PowerPoint here, but uh, my 12-year-old stepson will be proud. Levers are more than just teeter-totters. Levers can be used to apply, well, leverage. So what you're seeing here is a man that's trying to move a boulder that's too heavy for him to lift directly. What he has is a long pry bar, and the pry bar is sitting on top of a pivot. And it's going to, of course, rotate at the fulcrum that he's created. Now, the thing to note is that when he pushes down on this pry bar, he's going to amplify force on the other side. He's gonna amplify the force that's applied to the boulder, but he's not gonna move the boulder very far. So he's gonna to have to push down on the pry bar a much greater distance than the boulder will rise. Let's take a look at a simple example here. And in this example, we've got our pivot and fulcrum right in the middle of our bar. Now, if we push down on one side, the other side is going to move the same distance. So you can see here, we've pushed down on the right-hand side, demonstrated by the green arrow. That's where we've applied an effort. And on the other side, the end of the bar has raised by the same amount. Now, an important concept that we need to consider is work. And work has a very specific definition in physics. Work is force times distance. Force is measured in newtons, distance is measured in meters when we're dealing with SI metric measurements. So we end up with a value in newton meters, which can also just be expressed as joules. Incidentally, joules are used to measure energy, and energy is the potential to do work. So we've applied energy or work at one side, and we're getting the same amount of energy or work out at the other side. And that's, of course, because fulcrums are not magic. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. We have the same amount of work going in on one side as comes out on the other side. Now let's shift the fulcrum by shifting the pivot, because this is where things get more interesting. If we shift that pivot, then when we push down on one side, that end of the bar will move a different distance than the other end of the bar. Once again, we're applying the effort on the right side of the bar. Remember that the bar is going to rotate around the fulcrum. Because our effort is far away from the fulcrum, we're gonna have a lot of movement at that end and much less movement at the other end. And I've taken some time and measured things out on this diagram so that we get a nice simple example with some simple math that works out nicely. Okay, so let's say for the sake of argument that our effort requires us to push the bar down two meters. Okay, that's the distance that's shown by this green arrow. On the other side, we've got a distance of one meter. And if you want to check, um, yeah, the red arrow is 
half the length of the green arrow. Okay, so let's also say, just for the sake of argument and for the sake of nice simple math, that the force we're applying is two newtons. So we're applying a force of two newtons. We're multiplying that by our distance of two meters, and we're getting a value of four and uh, we could express that as newton meters or we could express it as joules and i should mention that my equating joules with newton meters directly is not quite accurate but that's okay for for our purposes i think remember that the amount of work or energy that we apply on one side of the fulcrum has to equal what comes out on the other side of the fulcrum. And again, that's because fulcrums are not magic. We can't create additional work or create uh, additional energy. Now on the other side, we have one half the distance that we had on the right side. So we have one meter instead of two. But we also generate twice the force. So we generate four newtons. And of course, if we multiply those two together, we get our value of four Newton meters or four joules. So again, the main principle here is that the amount of work or energy is going to be conserved on either side of the pivot. But you can see what we've done is we've generated extra force by sacrificing distance. I mean, if we had something really, really heavy, we could have a huge long lever arm and we could still move that heavy object. We just wouldn't move it very far. Let's flip this example around. What would happen if you applied your effort on the other end, the end that's closer to the fulcrum? Well, you wouldn't get the mechanical advantage that you got by using the other end. Mechanical advantage refers to the fact that you can use a lever to amplify force. And this is usually how we think of levers in everyday life. You're going to use maybe a long pry bar to uproot a stump or lift up a boulder in your backyard. What you're doing in that case is you're holding the long end. You're pushing that down. You're pushing it a fairly far distance. You're not moving the stump very far, but you're applying a lot more force to the stump than you could otherwise. Well, in this situation, you have to apply more force. So if we look at the left hand side here, we're applying twice as much force as we were in the last example, but we're only applying that over half the distance. The other side is going to move twice as far. Now, let's just say for the sake of argument that it took you one second to move that left end of the bar down to its final position. The other side moved twice the distance in that same time. It moved twice as fast. So in a case like this, you're amplifying the speed at which the other end of the bar moves. And you might be surprised to learn that this is how most of your muscles work, as we'll see. For any lever, we have two arms. We have one arm on one side of the fulcrum and another arm on the other side of the fulcrum. The effort arm is the arm that you're applying the force to. You're pushing down on it or pulling up on it in the hopes of moving the resistant arm. The resistant arm is going to resist that movement. So in the example of moving a boulder with a pry bar, you're pushing down on the effort arm. The resistant arm is wedged under the boulder and you're hoping to move the boulder upwards. Now, if your effort arm is longer than your resistant arm, you have a mechanical advantage. That means that you can amplify the force that you're applying on the other side. Although keep in mind, you're not gonna move things as far when you do that. So mechanical advantage occurs if you take the effort arm, divide it by the resistant arm and get a value larger than one. If you take the effort arm and divide it by the resistant arm and you get a value that's less than one, you get a decimal value, then you don't have a mechanical advantage. I, I guess you could say you have a mechanical disadvantage, although I don't think that term is actually used. So again, just remember 
that when you're looking at these kind of situations, the work that's being done on both sides has to be the same. And that means that if we move the fulcrum off center, we're going to introduce a situation where we can perhaps amplify force or amplify the speed at which something moves. There's a very famous statement by Archimedes, who was a scientist from classical Greece, <clears throat> and he stated, give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth. What he was suggesting is if you gave him a lever with a long enough effort arm and a place to stand, which is kind of a problem, somewhere out in space, he could move the planet. There's a few problems with that because of course the earth generates its own gravity. I won't get into any of that, but uh, I have a nice little cheesy old uh, movie to demonstrate that. Meet Mr. Archimedes of ancient Greece. Long ago, Archie said, give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. What Archimedes meant was that the power of a lever is practically unlimited. Today, almost everyone uses some form of lever in his daily work. The familiar can opener is a lever with a sharp cutting edge. The playground seesaw is just a simple lever too. It takes a lot of force to start a freight car moving, yet the railroad man can start the heaviest freight cars easily with a pinch bar, a powerful lever which turns the wheel. Tough luck, old boy. Here's a place where a lever comes in mighty handy. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10 pound weight on this end and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. I love those old science and engineering films. Um, and if you're wondering what a lever could possibly have to do with a transmission, well, basically, gears are circular rotating levers. Uh, feel free to look up that film on YouTube and learn a bit more about that, but it's a bit off topic. Okay, so we were talking about mechanical advantage and remember that when we have an effort arm that is longer than the resistance arm, we make things a bit easier for ourselves. We can generate additional force on the other side of the fulcrum. That doesn't happen very often in your body. There's one example and that would be on the right of this diagram where that's occurring. So we have a muscle known as the diagastric muscle. That's down here, it's generating an effort. And then up the top, we have our fulcrum. And that's at the temporomandibular joint where the jaw attaches to the underside of the skull. That's where the jaw is going to pivot. Now note that we also have resistance being offered here. It's being offered by another muscle. So that's a muscle that closes the jaw. The diagastric muscle is going to lower the jaw. Um, so it's going to depress the jaw or open the mouth. Now the muscle at the top is the temporalis muscle and it's offering resistance because it does the opposite motion. Um, it's going to close the jaw. So this is something I haven't talked about yet, but we have our resistance arm and our effort arm on the same side of the fulcrum. But in any case, if we take the effort arm and we divide that by the resistance arm, you can see that we get a mechanical advantage of 2.7. And that means we have a high mechanical advantage. It means that this fairly weak muscle generates a fair bit of additional force and we can open the jaw with a fair bit of force but we have to do it fairly slowly that muscle has to contract quite a bit to move the jaw now if we look at the other diagram to the left we see a more usual situation we're looking at the biceps here and the biceps are going to contract and create tension and pull this way and it's going to pull on the radius. 
Now the fulcrum is actually over here. And once again, our effort arm and our resistance arm are on the same side of the fulcrum. And look how small that effort arm is. So where the biceps attach to the radius is very close to the fulcrum. The resistance arm goes all the way out to the hand. And of course, you might be holding something in your hand as well. That would be additional weight and maybe additional length as well if you're holding, I don't know, a baseball bat or something like that. So here we have very little mechanical advantage. We don't actually have a mechanical advantage. We have a mechanical disadvantage, I guess you could say. But a short movement, a small movement of the biceps will create a very large movement of the hand. And that's how this works. That's why things are set up this way. Let's take a closer look at that example. So here we have the biceps again. They're contracting. Remember that muscles can only generate force when they contract. They're never going to push. They're always going to pull. So it's creating tension and it's pulling on the radius. It's pulling on the radius very close to the fulcrum. We have a load in this case that's being held in the hand. So the weight of that is going to be pulling down, of course, and the effort is going to have to counter that. Now, because the effort is being applied very close to the fulcrum and the load is on the same side as the effort, we don't have any mechanical advantage. But once again, that muscle, the biceps, doesn't have to shrink very much to create a rather large movement at the hand. We have three classes of levers, and these classes are based upon the relative position of the load, fulcrum, and effort. In a first class lever, we have the effort at one end, the load at the other, and the fulcrum in the middle. And this is probably what you're most used to from everyday life. So something like a teeter-totter. Now in the human body, these tend to occur within the axial skeleton. And we have a nice example of one of these first class levers in the diagram on the right. So the fulcrum in this case is the joint between the skull and the vertebral column. So remember, the occipital bone of the skull has these two condyles on it that are going to articulate with the atlas, which is the first cervical vertebrae. And this is where most of the nodding motion of your head occurs. So we're looking here at the muscles that attach to the back of the skull, to the occipital bone. So things like the trapezius, for instance. And they'll pull the head back. And what they're doing is they're acting on the load, which is the weight or mass of the front of the skull, basically the weight of the face. In a second class lever, the load is positioned between the fulcrum and the effort. A really good example of this from everyday life is a wheelbarrow. So the wheel is where things are gonna pivot, that's the fulcrum, and then we have our effort arm, which ends in the handle that you would lift. And you can lift a pretty heavy load. You can lift a heavier load if those handles are even longer, but it gets to a point where it doesn't really make any sense because you have to, of course, lift the handles further. Now, there are some examples of this in the body, and one of the best ones would be the calf muscles. So the gastrocnemius and the soleus, which is underneath the gastrocnemius, are going to raise you up onto your toes. And the weight of your body, so the load, is going to come down here, down through this part of the foot. The fulcrum would be the balls of your feet, and the effort is being created by, as I said, the gastrocnemius and the soleus mainly. And they're lifting up the heel. Those muscles can lift a lot of weight. I mean, they can bring your entire body, the entire mass of your body, up onto your tiptoes. So it's quite an effective system. Finally, we have the situation where the effort is located between the load and the fulcrum. 
this is what we see in the biceps, the example that we've talked about quite a bit. So we have no mechanical advantage here. We have to generate quite a bit of force to move the hand and the arm, but we don't have to contract the biceps very much. They contract a small amount and that will move the hand a large amount. And when you think about it, this is kind of the way limbs have to work. If we were to have mechanical advantage, then that would mean that the muscles would have to somehow stretch across like this to the hand. That would look really weird. The orientation of fascicles in a muscle will give you a big hint as to what that muscle does and what kind of movement it causes. So we're looking at the lines on the muscle. I'm not talking about microscopic striations. I'm talking about the fascicles, which are kind of the grain of the muscle. And if you were doing a dissection, you look at those lines and you know that the muscle is going to contract along those lines, along those fascicles. So if we take a look at the uh, pectoral muscle, which is shown in the upper right, you can see that we've got these lines, these fascicles, and they all converge onto this tendon. So the origin of the pectoralis major muscle is on the ribs and sternum, and the insertion is onto the humerus. So all of these fascicles tie into a tendon, and then that tendon is going to tie into the humerus. And when this muscle contracts, it's going to pull the humerus towards the midline. So we would call that adduction. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Now, if we look on the other side, the type top left here, we've got a circular muscle. We've talked about sphincters before. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. So it's a circle of muscle that can constrict. Now, in this case, we don't have an origin and an insertion. These are muscles that are found around the mouth that constrict the mouth and make you pout. Uh, they're found around the eyes as well, so they'll cause you to squint. And as we've talked about, you have sphincters that are associated with your digestive system as well. And some of them are skeletal muscle, the voluntary ones are. We can have fascicles arranged in parallel. So the sartorius muscle is a very long straight muscle and all of the fascicles are arranged in a straight line. There's several other different types we can have that we won't get into in much detail here, but note that we can have a tendon that runs up through the muscle, and then we can have bellies that attach to that. We can have a muscle known as a multi-pennant muscle, the deltoid's a good example of that, where we have connective tissue that branches off and we have bellies attached to each of those branches. Muscles form functional groups they don't work entirely on their own. So we tend to have muscles clustered together that perform similar activities or work together to bring about an orchestrated movement. I know I've mentioned this a few times before, but it's worth stressing again. Remember that muscles create tension. They can contract forcefully, but they can't push. So they will pull, but they will not push. If we're looking at a particular motion, Generally, there is one primary muscle that does most of the work, and that's known as the agonist or prime mover. Other muscles that help that prime mover are known as synergists. So there's a synergy, they're working together. A muscle that opposes the action is known as an antagonist. So the biceps are going to flex the arm, but the triceps are going to extend the arm. Those are opposite motions. They are antagonistic to each other. The terms I've listed here are terms that you should know already, I'm hoping. They're rather important terms. They describe movements at joints and they describe the actions of muscles. So if you don't understand these terms, you won't be able to describe what a muscle does. And I may ask you to define or explain these terms on a test. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through these terms. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna put up a supplemental PowerPoint um, that will just explain these terms so you can review uh, if you've forgotten some of this stuff. When you're learning the names of muscles, pay attention to what the names mean. 
very often the name will give you some important information. So for instance, the name might include something that tells you where on the body you're seeing the muscle. Perhaps in terms of position, is it posterior or anterior or superficial? It might tell you the location on the body. So the abdominus muscle is on the abdomen. It might tell you where it attaches. So is it a femoris muscle? Does it attach to the femur? If it's got costalis in the name, that means it connects to a rib. If it's got cutaneous in the name, it connects to the skin, etc. The name might tell you something about the shape. So deltoid means triangle. Um, serratus means serrated. It could tell you what the muscle does. Is it an abductor or adductor or rotator, etc. So pay attention to the muscle names. They will help you out quite a lot. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through some of the more important or more obvious muscles of the body. There's a lot of muscles. There's about 650 named muscles in your body. You're going to learn more of those muscles in lab because, of course, lab focuses on structures more. But I thought I'd pick out just some of the really obvious ones, the ones that perform really important, really noticeable motions, and the ones that you can feel on yourself, the ones that you can see on your own body, the ones that act as landmarks. And these two figures here from the front, from the anterior and from the posterior, just give you a nice overview of where these muscles are located. Okay, so let's dive into these different muscles. We'll start with the sternocleidomastoid, which is one of my favorite muscles, actually. I'm not sure why, I think I like the name. The name tells you so much about this muscle. So the muscle originates on the sternum, on the manubrium, which is the top bone of the sternum, and the clavicle. So sterno refers to sternum, Cleto refers to clavicle, and it inserts onto the mastoid process of the temporal bone. That's that lump of bone that you can feel behind your ear. So sternocleidomastoid, it tells you all of its attachments, basically. Now, what's kind of interesting is you can see this muscle very clearly if you turn your head and also tilt your head down at the same time, this muscle kind of pokes out. The head is generally what's going to be moved by this muscle. However, this muscle can also assist in very, very heavy breathing. It can actually raise the chest. In order to do that, other muscles that help support the head have to contract and keep the head in place while the sternocleidomastoid contracts so that it can raise the rib cage a bit. But generally, it's moving the head. But that's one case where origin and insertion can get a bit confusing sometimes. Next we have the masseter. The masseter attaches to the zygomatic bone and to part of the zygomatic arch and it comes down onto the mandible. Note that behind that we have the temporalis muscle. The masseter muscle is one that you can feel if you clench your jaw, uh, you can feel that quite easily. As mentioned, the temporalis muscle is behind the masseter. So what they've done here is they've removed the masseter and they've cut away the zygomatic arch. And you can see this is a broad muscle. It's a rather powerful muscle and it connects to the side of the head, to the parietal and sphenoid bones. That would be the origin. And then it inserts onto the coronoid process of the mandible, pulls on that and closes the jaw. So it's going to elevate the jaw. The muscles of the back. So there are a few important ones that you can see here. Now we're seeing the trapezius on the left hand side. The other half is missing, but of course if it was there, it would be like this and you can see it would form a trapezoid. It would form kind of a diamond shape. So this is another example of the name of a muscle telling you something about it, in this case, the shape. The other thing that's interesting about the trapezius 
is because it's such a large muscle, it has fascicles running in several different directions. And as you can see, it does a lot of different things. It extends the head, so that means it moves it backwards. It also adducts, elevates, and depresses the scapula. So the reason for that is we have fibers that run this way, right, which can pull on the head and extend the head, but we also have fibers that run across this way and fibers that run down this way, and these fibers are going to pull on the scapula. The origin is from the first cervical vertebrae, so the atlas, down to the 12th thoracic vertebrae, and the insertion is on the occipital bone of the skull, the clavicle, and the scapula. And we have lots of fascicles that insert onto the scapula. And here's a nice view of that. And what you're seeing here in the different colors are the different orientations of the fiber. So remember we talked about motor units, so we talked about the fact that a whole muscle doesn't have to contract. Well, this muscle acts almost like three different muscles. Motor units in just one of these colored segments can contract and bring about a very specific motion. The latissimus dorsi is a very flat, broad muscle, and you can see that it originates off of the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae, and it connects onto the inside, kind of the medial side of the humerus. When it contracts, it's going to pull on the humerus. It can cause the humerus to rotate medially. That means it's going to rotate towards the midline, but it also adducts the humerus. That means it pulls the entire humerus, the entire arm towards the midline, and it can extend the humerus as well. It pulls it backwards. So if you're at the gym and you're doing pull downs, you're working on your lats, these are the muscles that you're trying to bulk up. Deltoid means triangular, and you can see that this is a triangular muscle that sits on top of the uh, shoulder, and it inserts into the humerus. Once again, we can get different actions created by this muscle depending on which fascicles contract. So if only the front portion of the deltoid contracts, that's going to bring the arm forward. If we have all of these contract, it's going to adduct the arm. And we can have just one part contract or mostly one part and a little bit of another. So this will fine tune the motion that occurs. Originates on the clavicle and scapula and inserts on the humerus. Abduction would be its primary function though. So if you're at the gym and you're taking weights You've got your arms straight out and you're lifting your arms away from your sides, you would be working out your deltoid. The pectoralis major. So the pectoralis major is the larger of two pectoralis muscles. We have the pectoralis minor underneath it. The pectoralis major is going to attach to the sternum, the clavicle, and also costal cartilages, and then it's going to insert on the humerus. And its main function is to adduct the arm, but it also flexes and rotates the arm as well. So if you are doing, let's say you're lifting free weights, you're lifting dumbbells, a lot of people will give them a little twist as they're lifting them because that is part of the action of this muscle. The pectoralis minor is much smaller as you can see. So the minor and major refer to the size of these muscles. It's kind of interesting that in a lot of other mammals, the size is reversed. Uh, in cats, for instance, the pectoralis minor is actually the larger muscle. Next, we have the biceps brachia. And the biceps have two origins. Each of them are on the scapula. The main insertion is onto the radius. In fact, there's a little tubercle there, a little bump where this attaches. But there's also a sheet of connective tissue that attaches onto the ulna as well. When this muscle contracts, it's going to flex the elbow joint. So it's going to decrease the angle of the elbow joint. Now on the other side, we have the triceps brachia. The triceps are going to extend the elbow joint. They're gonna straighten out the arm. 
we have three origins, hence the tri. We have one on the scapula and two on the humerus. The insertion is the olecranon, which is that bony bit that sticks out from the ulna. There are four large flat muscles that make up the abdominal wall. And you can see that these muscles are in layers and the fascicles run in different directions. So we have oblique muscles, the external obliques and the internal obliques, and the fascicles run obliquely across the abdomen. They compress the abdomen, but they're also involved in flexing the abdomen side to side. We have transverse abdominus muscle here, and the fascicles run transversely across the abdomen. Again, they compress the abdomen, but they can also flex the abdomen side to side. The one muscle that I'm going to focus on is the rectus abdominis. Rectus means straight, and this is a long straight muscle, so you're seeing it on one side of the body here. It's mirrored on the other side, but you can see that the fascicles run whoops, in this direction, and when they contract, they cause you to flex your uh, abdomen. So what would happen if you were doing a sit-up, for instance, and you're not moving side to side? Now, it originates from the costal cartilages and the xiphoid process, and it runs all the way down to the pubis. So it is quite a long muscle. It's said to insert on the pubis, but this is one of those cases where origin and insertion can be a bit confusing. So this is what it's been decided. It originates from the costal cartilages and the xiphoid and inserts on the pubis. Uh, the reason for that is in most cases, the insertion is also considered to be the smaller surface that it attaches to. But if you think about it, when you flex this muscle, it could be that you're lying on your back and you're raising your knees, in which case the pubis is moving and your rib cage is staying still. But it could also be that you've got someone holding your knees and you're doing a sit-up, in which case the pubis is staying still and the rib cage is moving. So again, it can be a little confusing using these terms sometimes. These muscles also preserve the rigidity of the abdominal wall because you don't have any bones in there. I mean, this is a fairly large area that's not supported by anything rigid. So these muscles are quite important for maintaining a little bit of rigidity to the abdomen. Between the ribs, we have intercostal muscles. And once again, pay attention to the names. They do make a lot of sense. Inter means between, costal means having to do with the ribs. So these are muscles that run between the ribs. They're kind of tasty muscles too if you're into spare ribs. These are the muscles that you're eating. External means towards the outside. Internal, of course, means towards the inside. So the external intercostals are superficial to the internal intercostals. Or you could also say that the internal intercostals are deep to the external intercostals. Notice that the fascicles run in different directions. So for the external intercostals, the net force that's going to be generated is going to pull the rib cage down. It's going to depress the ribs and it's going to help you breathe out forcefully if you're breathing very, very heavily. With the internal intercostals, the net force generated is upwards and it's going to cause the rib cage to expand. So it's going to elevate the ribs and it's going to help you breathe in. The main muscle responsible for breathing, of course, is the diaphragm. And in fact, if you're at rest, it should be pretty much the only muscle involved. So this is a muscle, it's a thin sheet of muscle that is kind of bowl shaped and it separates the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity. When it contracts, it flattens out a bit and that increases the volume within the thoracic cavity. It reduces the pressure within the thoracic cavity and the lungs expand into that space. When it relaxes, the opposite happens. It forms a more bowl shape again that reduces the volume and increases the pressure within the thoracic cavity and air is expelled from the lungs. 
It's an unusual looking muscle, as you can see. We've got this central tendon in the middle, and then we've got fascicles coming off from all the way around, coming off of the xiphoid process, uh, the ribs um, and vertebrae, and meeting up on that tendon. There's a couple of holes in it as well for the passage of the esophagus and the inferior vena cava. Another thing to note, it's interesting in that it is a skeletal muscle and you can take voluntary control of it, but generally you don't. Generally you don't have to think about your breathing. So I said I was covering important and also kind of showy muscles. The gluteus maximus, very showy muscle, makes up most of the uh, bulk of your butt, I guess we could say. It is going to originate off of the ilium, sacrum, and coccyx, and it inserts onto the femur, and it's one of the major movers of the femur. So it's going to extend the leg, so move it backwards, and it's also going to rotate the thigh laterally. The quadriceps are a group of four muscles that extend the knee. I'm just going to focus on the rectus femoris for the purposes of lecture. The rectus femoris is a long muscle. It's a long straight muscle. Again, rectus means straight. And it's also the muscle that passes directly over the knee. And the tendon going over the knee contains the patella, which is the largest sesamoid bone in your body. So when it contracts, it's going to extend the knee and it can also flex the entire leg so it can bring the thigh up uh, in front of you. Next we have the adductors of the leg. These make up the meaty portion of the inner thigh. And this is a really nice example of a synergistic group. So these four muscles that you can see here are performing a similar function in that they're adducting the leg, they're moving the leg towards the midline. Now, if we had just one muscle doing this, when it contracted, especially if it contracted quickly, we might get kind of a jerky motion. One of the positive benefits of having synergistic muscles like this is you'll notice they don't all do the exact same motion. So look at the fascicles, they run in slightly different directions, especially the gracilis. And when they all contract together, there's kind of a dampening effect they resist each other a little bit, which just kind of smooths out the contraction. So we get a nice uniform movement of the leg. There's a bunch of them here, but I'm just gonna focus on the gracilis. The sartorius. I think the sartorius is my favorite muscle. And let me tell you why. Well, for one reason, it's the longest muscle in your body. It's this thin strap-like muscle. And what it does is it flexes the thigh and rotates the thigh laterally. So if you sit down in a chair and you cross your legs, you're using this muscle to do that. It originates off of the ilium and it runs to the tibia. So I think it's kind of cool in that it's this very long strap-like muscle, but also the word sartorius in Latin means tailor. And tailor's my last name, so can't blame me for liking this muscle. Uh, incidentally, if you go to a tailor and get a pair of pants tailored, uh, what they do is they run a measuring tape up your inseam and along the sartorius muscle. So that's how it got that name. On the back of the femur, we've got a group of muscles that are commonly referred to as the hamstrings. The one that I'm going to focus on is the biceps femoris, and you can see it originates on the ischium, of the pelvis and it inserts onto the tibia and fibula. Now where it inserts and where the other hamstrings insert, we have tendons that cross that joint and form the tendons you can feel on the back of your leg. So these tendons are very, very obvious. They're very prominent and they form the popliteal fossa. So the popliteal fossa is the depression between those tendons on the back of your knee. The way they get their name is kind of a bit sad, but uh, in the past, if people were breeding pigs, and the pigs were a bit rambunctious, they would cut these tendons. 
And if you do that, of course, the pig can't bend its leg backwards. It has to run stiff-legged, and it's more easy to control. The origin for the biceps femoris, which is the only one I'm going to focus on, is the ischium. Remember, that's part of the pelvis, and then it inserts onto the tibia and fibula. The calves are made up of the gastrocnemius and then the soleus deep to the gastrocnemius. They both perform a similar function, so they're both going to raise you up on your toes, but as I talked about before, the gastrocnemius is a faster muscle and it's going to help you with things like jumping, and then the soleus is going to play a larger role for more endurance type activities. I'm just going to focus on the gastrocnemius because it is the most obvious of the two. It originates from the femur and it inserts onto the calcaneus, which is the bone of the heel. Finally, we have the tibialis anterior. The name tells you a whole lot. It's located on the anterior of the tibia. It originates from the tibia and inserts onto the metatarsals. And what it does is it dorsiflexes the uh, foot, that means it raises the toes up, and it also inverts the foot, which means it rotates it towards the midline. This is a rather important muscle in walking. If you weren't able to raise your toes, you'd be dragging them along the ground. And our terminology. So at the top, I have just the general terminology, and then down the bottom there, I have the muscles that I want you to know for lecture. So there's going to be more muscles that you need to know for lab, but these are some of the most important ones that I've picked out just for lecture.